Welcome to Rome. This is The Bittersweet Life with Katie Sewell and Tiffany Parks. Hello, this is The Bittersweet Life. I'm Katie Sewell. Slowly, 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 the world is opening up and some of you are starting to travel again. So today I wanted to share a conversation that I hope will help you appreciate your time out in the world in an even richer way, whenever it is that you get that time. A few years ago, I spoke with Professor Dan Butterworth. He was working on a yet unpublished manuscript titled A Writing Traveler, Deepening Your Journey Through Writing. The idea of the book is to use writing as a way to develop a richer engagement with what's going on around you when you travel. And just because the book hasn't been released yet doesn't mean we can't discover the ideas within it, which we are about to do. My thanks goes out to listener Katie Merck for highlighting this conversation and for letting us know that it completely changed the way that she journals. I started the conversation with Dan asking about his experiences living abroad. I've lived in Italy uh, for two different stints of about six months each. And ever since, what, about 2005, maybe, I've been abroad every year. I spent some time in Zambia and most of the rest of Europe. My, I guess my inaugural trip was uh, after my freshman year in college. Rather than study abroad, I went with actually my girlfriend at the time. And we just went to Europe, had no itinerary, got some cheap, I think it was literally about a $300 charter one way to Brussels. I was 18. Wow, that's so bold. That's so much bolder than me. See, see, one of my biggest regrets as a young person is that I didn't really travel very much Um, until I was out of college. And so I feel like, ah, I mean, just hearing about the fact that you get to take these students to Florence every year, and I think, why was I not going after that? Yeah. No, I have some of those same regrets too, even though I did travel, but I just wish I had about, six or seven different lifetimes to spend abroad, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Do you find that your students, when you take them to Florence for these writing excursions that you do come back as changed people? Well, for one thing, when you're there for, you know, anything over a week or two, even that is enough to change you. But I've done two semesters over there and that's a lot of time. You do come back a very different person. And coming back to a place like Spokane is really weird because we don't have the same kind of street culture downtown. And so, you know, in a place like Florence, everything happens in the city and the piazzas are the living room, right? Maybe that's the cliche they say, but it really is true. People just go and hang out there. You come to Spokane and it's like, oh my God, it's six o'clock in the evening and the streets are deserted. Now, granted, I'm usually returning in the summer and it's really hot over here, as you have discovered. Right? It's 95 degrees. I saw it on a reader board as I was driving over here. Yeah. So, um, yeah, travel is definitely transforming, I think. Of course, the students are awesome. We actually have a campus over there. So the students feel like residents. And whenever you're in a foreign place and you have a reason to be there beyond simply being there, you know, so you're working, you're studying, they come back really, you know, even more beautiful than when they left. Their horizons have expanded. They're smarter. They're more sensitive. They get the problems that are going on in the world. A place like Florence for many, many years has had pretty significant immigration, a lot of illegal immigration, largely from Africa. And you can't be in those streets, for example, without seeing this weird hazing dance thing that the cops do with the Senegalese purse merchants, you know, who set up their little tapestries. And then when the police come through, pick them up and just scatter. Our kids see that. It's hard to be naive after you see those things. You know, in the, in the ancient world, uh, you can see this in a, a poem like The Odyssey or something. In the ancient world, a person's 
intelligence was measured by what they'd seen and where they'd been, right? And the traditions of hosting were really robust. A culture was judged by its manner of welcoming strangers, right? And travelers. So our, our students pick up a lot of that. And, and the privileged position I'm in is that I get to read about their growth because I'm having them write about their experiences. Do you find that their writing changes? Yes. Why? Because what travel does is really kind of what you want to have happen when you write anyway. And that is you kind of need to become hypersensitive to your surroundings. You need to pay attention, a special kind of attention, the kind of, I mean, poets, I would argue, have a kind of concentration that is a sort of entering into a zone where you try to see things for what they are. You try to defamiliarize them from the habitual ways that we understand them. Travel does that automatically because you see things you don't understand all the time, right? The food, the clothing, the behavior. How can that woman ride the bicycle holding the poodle with a child in the child seat while she smokes a cigarette and talks on her phone? And she's wearing high heels. You know, how can all of that happen? And you see that and you realize, okay, I'm in a different kind of place. And that sort of shifting that occurs of your sensibilities is really exactly the kind of space you want to be in when you write. That kind of concentration and attention is almost automatic. And then there's another thing that happens that is sort of counterintuitive. And that is that when people are abroad, they discover the value of their own experience and their own memory from back home. So one of the tricks that I use to open up students' experience to uh, their travel and the way travel kind of engages their thinking about the nature and the shape of their lives something happened to you or you saw something on the piazza this morning. What memory does that conjure up? You know, were you also on a bicycle? Maybe it was a single speed red Schwinn. The chain fell off and so you ran into a fence or something. If you can start exploring that in the context of what you witnessed here, say on the streets of Florence, pretty amazing things start happening in your connecting, in your making meaning out of the shape of your experience. Does it help at all that you're more isolated too when you're traveling? Yeah, there's a freedom, a freedom from uh, the commitments of your personality, you know, to who people expect you to be. There's also, this will sound maybe, maybe this isn't a good thing to say about traveling, But, you know, there's something pretty wonderful that happens when you're immersed in a linguistic field that's not your own. I mean, one of the things, have you ever been on a train and people are talking Mm -hmm. in a foreign language that you don't understand? Sure. And you assume they're talking about you. I mean, there's this a kind... (laughs) Do I? I never do. Well, a lot of people (laughs) that I talk to uh, do kind of find that there's this weird little kind of paranoia that oh, are they talking about me? What are they talking about? We're in this field of language, but we don't know what it means. And it it does the same kind of thing. I used the word defamiliarization earlier. It's a term that comes from, I think it's Russian formalism from the beginning of the 20th century. And basically they were trying to define what poetry is. And so they would say, well, poetry is the business of defamiliarizing. What do you mean defamiliarizing? Well, okay, if we say, you know, we would expect to hear, well, last night we went swimming in the pool, right? That's what we expect because we know the nature of the subject, the verb, and and the modifiers, and, and that our language unfolds that way. So I could defamiliarize it by saying, you know, last night we went bluing in the pool. And blue, so I've verbed, right? Uh, a different kind of word. It's, it's not radically unusual, but it's unusual enough to kind of get people to say, well, hey, wh- what, what's that all about? What does it mean to be bluing in the pool? And, 
if I were to write the poem, I might go on with the defamiliarization. I'm trying to get into that business of that weird, the kind of supernatural blue of pools at night, you know, when there are lights shining in the water. And it's just so, it's magnificent because it's so strange, right? So what I'm getting at is that being immersed in this place where there's language going on all around you gives you a little distance from your own language, right? So you use a word like danger. Danger, that's a strange word. Where does that come from? What are the roots for that? What are the acoustical properties of that? And so I think all of that does a lot to make us, give us a kind of hypersensitivity that's very productive for writing. I did a lot of travel in Vietnam, and I also found that there, particularly because the language is so hard and you can't even read it, that all of a sudden you realize also that you're not being advertised to anymore. Sweet. Yes. I mean, you might recognize a Coca-Cola symbol, yeah, but right. otherwise you can't. None of the rest of it registers. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I'm trying to think. I mean, I've been in Arabic countries where it's pretty much the same, right? Where, except for the images, the language just isn't there. So you look at a sign and you have no idea what's going on. You know, okay, and then I'm thinking of a place like Egypt where the clothing is radically different, right? I mean, it's one of the closest places to a kind of Western European model where you can go and everything is pretty radically different. And of course, that does all of this defamiliarizing so much quicker and more thoroughly. So it's, yeah, it's, it's fabulous. I think getting to the book that you wrote and the reason why I drove over here today, I think that when people often think about travel and writing, they think about blogging or having some sort of newsletter that they're sending home to their family to update them. A lot of people are trying to make their living that way right now, but that's not exactly what you're talking about, right? Exactly. In fact, if you were to survey the books on travel and writing, what you would find is that most of the books out there are really designed to teach people to write travel essays or to write travel blogs or to write things that are designed specifically for the public attention. And while that's great and fine, I'd completely endorse all of that. What I'm interested in is flipping it a little bit so that rather than thinking about, oh, travel is an occasion that will inform my writing so that I can then get an audience and maybe sell a piece or, or gain fame or whatever. And what I'm interested in a little more is, and this comes from being a teacher, knowing that of the hundreds or thousands of students I've taught, you know, a small percentage has gone on to become professional with writing. Most of us actually don't publish a lot of professional writing. And yet writing is still incredibly valuable as a tool. And so the flipping that I'm trying to do with, with the teaching of writing is I want the writing to deepen the experience. In other words, if you think of any of the strategies that you might be aware of for how to write a certain kind of, of piece well, what I want to say is, look, use those strategies for your observation. Use those strategies for your thinking. Use those strategies to analyze um, your experience, to become more thoughtful. And when you do that through writing, not only do you actually wake yourself up to the experience of the foreign, to places and people that you are encountering during your travel, but you're, you are also archiving your experience, right? And you are also creating pieces that occasionally warrant development and polishing so that they can become the blog or they can become the essay. I'm looking at writing as if it were a different sensory organ that opens up the world and teaches you things that you don't know yet until you have explored them in this medium. Can you give us an example? Section three is the protagonist journey that we okay. should consider ourselves a protagonist. Is that? 
yeah. what you mean? Okay, so uh, if we were to just take, let's take a pretty basic paradigm for being a protagonist on a journey. Well, okay, let's think about the hero, right? Or let's think about the quest, right? If you look into quest literature, you would find that, oh, there are, say, a, a guy like Joseph Campbell, the great anthropologist, would maybe divide the journey into four main parts, right? So there'd be the departure. No, there'd be the call first, then the departure, then the entering into the zone of power, and then the return, all right? So if you study these things a little bit, like the call, and you learn that, oh, guess what? It's pretty conventional to um, resist the call. When you think about your own trip and the planning, saving up the money to do it, um, how you feel about flying, perhaps, if you apply the literary dimension to it, you realize that, oh, you know, th my experience is not, not only not alien to this mythical paradigm, it actually, a lot of it holds. And I can teach myself something about myself and about the nature of life, the world, and my experience if I realize that, oh, my fear of flying falls into an ancient pattern. When I use the word myth, um, I'm not talking about what's not true. I'm talking about stories that convey the deep truths of the human experience. That's what a myth is in the anthropological sense, right? So, Okay, well, do the same thing with, well, what is the departure all about? Well, the departure means that you have to cut yourself off from your standard, ordinary, reliable support systems, friends, family, the language you know. And the idea is that if you start thinking about that in a conscious way, it pumps up your not only your willingness to, but your interest in, in engaging in your journey and embracing even the discomforts more, right? You study the quest and you learn, for example, that one of the secrets of the quest is that the hero has already earned or already not earned her success by the end of the quest. It's the behavior along the way, right? That gets you the victory or the success or whatever. And when you, you know, you think about that and apply it to your travel, and I would suggest that that alone makes you more conscious of what you're doing and why you're doing it and what your goals are. So um, in the first part of the book, I try to do some I give some suggestions about how you can shape your thinking about traveling. The second part of the book is more focused on practical subjects to write about when you travel. And of course, you're writing about them as you travel because you want to engage them more deeply when you're there. The idea being that if you write about something, you are observing it, taking it in, remembering it better. Well, you're remembering it better, but I think you're also seeing better. So let's talk a little bit about art, right? So it's become sort of fashionable these days, at least in academic writing circles, to do what they call ekphrasis. Ekphrasis is writing about art, right? So what I would suggest, I mean, for example, in the book, I have different strategies of approaching, let's say, a painting. What do you mean strategies for approaching a painting? Well, when you're looking at a painting, let's, let's say, for example, there are some magnificent Brunelleschi frescoes in Santa Maria Novella, which is one of the main churches in Florence. What I advocate is, look, you can get into these paintings in a way that's going to make them come more to life. How do you do that? Well, you think about it the way a writer would think about it. Well, what does that mean? Well, you're looking for an angle. You've got to have an angle. What's the angle? Well, the angle, I think the first thing, at least that I find myself doing, is I'm looking for a story. I want to know 
the story of, of the painting. Now, there could be a historical story, as most of those are. That's, there are stories from the Bible or uh, from saints' lives or whatever. But um, there may be, it may be that I don't know that story. I could come up with an imaginative story. Well, what is that woman in the corner doing, weeping, while the three women behind her are talking? What's going on? Well, if I don't know the story that it actually depicts or was intended to depict by Brunelleschi, I might think that those three women are the fates, for example. So my imagination could create something. But I could also, because I may have my little handheld there, I might be able to research the panel and discover what it actually is. And that may go a long way toward bringing it alive to me. And yet, there are other stories. Well, there's the story of the artist who's doing it. What's going on in that guy's life as he's putting this thing together? And then, if you spend any time in Florence in churches looking at frescoes, you're going to learn there are a couple other things going on that are really cool and huge in the day, but we've sort of lost them. One is that there's this incredible network of the gaze so that if you look carefully, you can see that the painters configured things so that say, the Virgin Mary in this panel over on the right wall is looking across at someone in a panel on the left wall. And that may be a commentary about the biblical stuff. In other words, Mary may be looking at John the Baptist over here or may be looking at some saint who lived after Christ died or something like that. But it also often is that the model for the Virgin Mary was a woman who is looking across the panel at the model for another saint who was her daughter, who by the time these things were painted, the daughter is dead. And this is actually the case. So if you look into that sort of thing now, you can find some of that information out. Now, to me, that's really an amazing thing, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that may be a level that a lot of people aren't interested in going to, but for me, that kind of invests these quasi-mythical subjects with real lives. People who are walking down the same streets of Florence that I'm walking down, and very briefly, the second big untold or unremembered story is that most of the chapels in the churches in a place like Florence and throughout Italy, they're sponsored by patrons who are paying money. They're paying the painter. They're often paying for the actual architectural assembling of these chapels. And they're depicted there, right? They kind of are there in little cameos. That ends up being a kind of advertisement. It's the equivalent in the day for a big McDonald's sign that says, you know, or, you know, brought to you by Coke, right? And so, yeah, the Sassetti Chapel, well, brought to you by the Sassettis, and there they are. They're right there. Looking for those stories, do you encourage then your students, or do you yourself try to write those stories down and capture them in a particular way? Absolutely. I mean, every individual is going to bring a different interest and a different propensity to explore certain kinds of things, you know, they're all good. I mean, my job as a teacher is to encourage and validate whatever they want to do. There's no exploration of such a thing that's bad. I mean, it's all good. It can be more or less imaginative, more or less historically factual, but it's all, it's all really, really good stuff. And the students... I think a lot of my students have experienced that beautiful thing where they realize that, oh yeah, the writing is giving me something I didn't know that I had. It's actually teaching me. And all I have to do is give it my attention for a little bit. Have they told you certain things that they've learned through the writing? Let me, okay, so I was in Florence last spring. One of my students a woman named Mackenzie, went on this extraordinary trip during spring break to this just out-of-the-way, 
beach town in, I think it was Morocco. She wrote this beautiful piece about it. Kind of the critical point in the narrative is that with their limited Arabic, she and her friends named the town that they were going to where they had set up a meeting with someone who was going to drive them to this very obscure remote place. And they mispronounced the name, but they didn't know about it until they had been delivered to the wrong place by 200 miles or whatever, which was a big deal for them because they were traveling by bus and taxi, right? So what's typical about student writing in this context is something like that. The discovery is, oh, well, this is a benevolent or beneficent mistake, right? It's a brilliant mistake. That's how Elvis Costello would say. So yeah, I mean, are there mistakes when you travel and the mistake takes you to a place you wouldn't have been, you encounter people you wouldn't have known, you discover something about your own limitations and maybe even ignorance and your resilience, your ability to move on despite it. So one of your sections here is writing about people. Explain that. It can be hard to write about people because we have all these concerns about, you know, that are appropriate about, you know, I don't want to violate their privacy. And so we talk about, you know, getting permission and about changing names and things like that. But one of the challenges when we're traveling is that it's a tricky deal if you want to write about people because you'll discover that, oh, I don't have very intimate contact with a lot of people from the host country. Most of my contact is with people who are there in the kind of the tourist industry, right? Or people who are serving me in restaurants people who are behind the desk in the hotel or the pension or the person who comes through the train to collect my ticket and whatnot. So a lot of it has to do with observing people. Unless you know somebody there or you have a host family or you're there for a long time like my students are when we're in Florence, it's mostly a matter of watching people you will never probably even talk to. How do you generate something to say? How do you know what to observe about somebody? So I might give as an, a kind of spontaneous assignment, okay, do a collage of details about a person you observe. I would give some arbitrary number like, okay, I need 20 or 30 details. You know, it has to be high so that they really push, right? But what is that all about? Well, it's not enough just to say, she has black hair and this kind of face and she's wearing a dress. You have to look at mannerisms. Even if you don't understand the words that are spoken, you want to be able to characterize the manner of speaking. You want to look at the accoutrements. What is she holding? What kind of shoes does she have? How does she interact with her surroundings? Now, going further, is there anything that she's doing that might become the basis for a story? So we're sitting in a public square and we see a woman who is reading a newspaper and smoking and someone drops a map. She sees it, goes and picks it up, calls to the person, and the person doesn't turn around. So she takes the map and she goes and sits down. Now, that is actually a trigger that I've used to generate a story so that my students and I would either invent the story in class or they would write about the story, right? So they would finish the story based on that as a kind of uh, impulse to begin with. So, well, obviously one of the big things is going to have, what is it a map of? And if it's a map of the place where they are, what's been circled or what's been written on it? And what does that do to as a catalyst for the action of that person, right? So what are we doing? Well, we're just using that as a kind of brainstorming device to open up some kind of imaginative engagement with what such a person might be doing. I love that. There was a guy that sat around the corner from where my apartment was in Rome every single day on the same box. And it seemed like everyone in the neighborhood knew him, greeting him by name. But he was also dressed 
fairly nicely yeah. in a vest, a little cap. <laughs> and I ended up writing a story about that because I was just thinking, where is he coming from? Like, he's obviously going somewhere, and then he spends all day sitting on this corner. So why? What happened in his exactly. past? Yeah. Now, it's tricky to... You want to honor these people, right? So you don't want to trash that person, you know, and turn that person into a serial killer or something in your imaginative story. And that's another thing that I try to teach students is how to, how to not only honor people we don't know and by treating them with respect and coming up with a, a human story, you know, a story that would honor their human sensibilities. The idea being respect these people because you're kind of being voyeuristic of them exactly right so there's a really um well it's edward saeed's um orientalism i think it was published in the late 70s maybe the early 80s and saeed was a palestinian uh, scholar i mean a scholar from palestine and he does a great job of exploring how we come to the foreign with a set of prefabricated notions and stereotypes and so on, even when we're trying not to, that really ends up isolating us from genuine experience of the foreign. And so it's really hard to cultivate the kind of attitude that keeps us open and sensitive and doesn't encourage a kind of overlearning of principles and stereotypes based on our experience. When you're traveling, you tend to generalize quickly because you need to. Oh, this is how you buy a train ticket in this crazy Italian system, right? Or this is what you don't do on a public bus in Zambia, or you're going to get into big trouble. But I mean, if you overlearn it, then every bus you get on, you're applying that experience. And maybe it was an idiosyncratic you know, event that you experienced the first time. You don't know that it's proper to generalize from that. And so Edward Said kind of gets into all the political implications and consequences of, of that overgeneralization. And, and I, I really want students and writers to, to be sensitive to those. There is a hazard if you're writing a story about somebody that you're observing that all those stereotypes could come into play. Yeah. <laughs> Katie here, stepping into the show for a brief moment to say that if you're new to the program, don't be afraid to go back and listen from the beginning, or just dabble through the shows of the past. Most of our topics are timeless. They are as fun today as they were years ago. So please subscribe to the show and then explore. Also, if you're all caught up and you'd love some new content, we are releasing brand new episodes on patreon.com slash the bittersweet life podcast. This month, Tiffany reveals how she remembers so many ancient Roman facts off the top of her head, and I tell you the worst piece of advice I ever followed. All that and more for as little as $5 a month at patreon.com slash the bittersweet life podcast. There are links in the show notes. And one final thing, August is Tiffany's birthday month, and I would love to get her the gift of more reliable internet. We have had all sorts of internet issues in the past year, and this show has been all the harder to make because of it. As you know, Tiffany is in Rome and I am in Seattle. We are always working remote with each other. Help me build up enough money to give her this gift. Heck, give us both this gift. Send a one-time birthday present donation through PayPal at thebittersweetlife.net and send your greetings and well wishes to Tiffany at the same time. TheBittersweetLife.net And now, back to the show. What do you mean by Section 9, writing about ideas? Most travelers get to a place, if they engage it in anything other than a superficial level, they're going to start encountering ideas associated with the place. So a really simple one might be even a cultural stereotype, which is la bella figura, right? Which is the idea of beauty in, in Italy and beauty as 
a metaphor for what's excellent and, you know, aesthetically pleasing in all aspects of life. Well, La Bella Figura becomes something that is sort of sociologically loaded. We can stereotype Italians that way. Italians can sincerely hold it up as an aesthetic value that they might really prize. And somewhere between those things or those attitudes or, or kind of assessments of the idea, there's a lot of room for thinking about what does that mean? What is it all about? And how do I square that value with my experience of maybe the filthier, seedier sides of town or aspects of street life, things like that. Or take sfumato, right? Sfumato is this, I think Raphael is credited with being the master of sfumato. And what it is, is this kind of shading of both texture and color and, and light so that the shifting from, say, a blue to a purple is imperceptible. Where does blue end and where does purple begin kind of thing? And well, what is sfumato? What is that as an idea? You know, what is that as a metaphor? Do re relationships maybe work? Is there a sfumato principle in relationships? That might be an interesting idea. Well, what do I mean? Well, where in, you know, when um, attraction becomes love, when affection becomes love or when uncertainty becomes dislike or Stendhal. Have you heard, you know, so Stendhalismo? So all these are Italian ideas, but all the, all the different places have their ideas. But, you know, Stendhalismo. So Stendhal, this 19th century writer, is in, uh, I believe it's Santa Croce, and he gets faint, and he famously writes about it. So people have called it, you know, Stendhal syndrome or Stendhalismo. Stendhalismo is when you're so overwhelmed by beauty that you get ill, wow. <laughs> which is a cool idea, you know? I mean, so it, it might be easy for us to think about, I could easily go there with chocolate, you know what I mean? I could easily eat so many chocolate chips that I get sick, right? But a painting or paintings or the insides of churches or a sea, you know, being on the shore, can I get sick from all of that beauty? Well, Stendhal believed that you could. And that's an interesting idea. I love that. Is it always one word? No, not, no, not necessarily. <laughs> I mean, so another way of thinking about and some of the other examples I give are when you travel, you, for example, come into contact with your own mortality, I think a lot more often, right, than in our normal everyday lives at home. Why? Because traveling is intrinsically dangerous. It's dangerous getting on planes. I know it's more dangerous getting into cars, but... And also, if you're going to somewhere that's a lot more ancient than, say, the West Coast of the United States you're so much closer to things that happen further back, I think. And Absolutely. So you're more in touch with the world that has moved on, right? And you're more aware of the people who've passed through like ghosts, you know, and the wind has blown them on into eternity. And so mortality might be an idea I think is really worth exploring in that context. So there are lots of different ways of talking about mortality. It could be death. It could even be life. It could be the fragility of life. It could be our vulnerability. So it's not like I'm committed to one word, but travel encourages our exploring of kind of a lot of the fundamental ideas that govern our thinking and that help shape the nature of our lives. So love, memory, what is maturity? What does it mean to come of age? Any of the philosophical ideas, you know, the Delphic Oracle and lots of ancient texts and philosophers and religious figures have said, uh, you know where you should begin? Know thyself. Okay, well, there's an idea. 
What does that mean? Well, travel helps clarify what that might mean because we do become more vulnerable when we travel. And so our hold on that certainty of our identity, uh, it, it weakens. And so I think that's an idea that travel can, can actually give you some productive work on. I have to ask you about another one on here. Yeah. See, most of our episodes are only a half an hour long, but this is a special occasion, people. So <laughs> sit back and enjoy it. Um, okay, 12, building depth, invention strategies. Yeah. Okay, so when you write in a genre, you kind of have a toolbox, right? If you're writing fiction, then you have things you know about how to develop character. You have things you know about how to set a scene. There are a bunch of things you know about what to do in constructing a narrative arc that's going to create enough suspense and so on to uh, get the reader to go through the end of the story. So invention strategies are those toolboxes for the different genres of writing, but I guess I'm kind of saying for the different genres of thinking and feeling and experiencing. So an invention strategy, I was in, for the purposes of the book, I'm doing some kind of crazy stuff here. So, okay, so here's an example. I found actually this to work really well with my students. So there's a kind of poetry uh, that you may have looked at in college uh, called metaphysical poetry. It's called metaphysical poetry, not because it's about metaphysics, but because Samuel Johnson said that people like John Donne were metaphysical in that they used really weird comparisons and they wrote poems about really strange comparisons. So John Donne says his lover's love and his love joined together in the holy temple of a flea that has bit the two of them. And so their bloods are united in the flea. Now that is a weird thing that, that technically we call a metaphysical conceit. So what I do, for example, is say, hey, spend some time coming up with some strange comparisons that you could then explore and develop and who knows where that's going to take you, right? My students might say, I'm going to compare the city of Florence to a clock. Or I'm going to compare the city of Florence to a field of meadow grass. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now the challenge is, okay, how? Mm -hmm. So you have to be really imaginative and really inventive to get those things to make sense when you hold them up against each other, right? Mm -hmm. And when you do that, I mean, it's sort of beyond a metaphysical conceit or concept, but it's the metaphysical concept that got you going. So I could point to a bunch of different poetic devices, a bunch of different strategies for fiction writing, for example. I'm just saying, hey, use this to invent some new understanding that you don't yet have. Have you yourself done that? I think all writers do. I mean, all creative writers do it. All poets definitely do it. Yeah, so, so here's the principle in a way is discipline. If you impose any discipline on yourself as a writer, you're going to discover the magic of writing. And that is that, oh, the discipline is generative. It generates new ideas. For example, I would challenge you, write a paragraph, eh, 50 to 100 words, without using the letter E. This is a very simple discipline. Mm -hmm. But what it does is it makes you unable to go to the quickie mart of language in your head mm -hmm. and get the Doritos <laughs> and the, you know, the <laughs> junk food that you would normally get. And so you have to be more inventive with your vocabulary. Well, guess what? If you're more vo inventive with your vocabulary, the ideas you're going to express and explore are going to be different from they would, what they would be otherwise, right? So a more complicated version of that would be a sonnet. 
if I say write a sonnet, then I'm saying you're going to have to use patterns of iambic pentameter. So I can't just say, oh, well, it's 95 degrees outside. And so we've got the fan on, <laughs> you know, it's still hot, but it's OK. So I can't just talk like that. I've got to come up with something that says outside the heat that blows across the streets will make me think of things from summer's past. OK, now I had no idea where I was going to go. <laughs> All I knew is I needed to do the pattern, right? Mm -hmm. People think that, oh, that makes it hard because you're doing the pattern. No, the pattern, once I know the pattern, it's easy and it dictates where my imagination goes. See, that's my point in the book is that that's the creative in creative writing is, yes, it creates for people who want to read a good story or a good poem, but it creates our thinking too, right? And our observing, and it makes them much richer. Just out of curiosity's sake, how do you come up with these different writing exercises or parameters? Well, I'm a teacher of creative writing, so I've studied it. I've read a lot of books about it. Any creative writing teacher will know their bibliography of the main books that they go to, right? There's a great book called The Practice of Poetry by Twitchell and Ben. Those are last names. Mm -hmm. It's a compendium of creative writing teachers' favorite exercises, right? Our favorite prompts. So there are a lot of resources out there in the world and most of us will use things like that and get ideas either maybe from our own schooling and so on. But when you do much writing, you know, you realize, oh, I just discovered something that worked for me pretty well. Mm -hmm. And once you get inside those things, for example, writing a sonnet or writing, God forbid, heroic couplets or something <laughs> crazy like that, or a villanelle or a sestina, you know, these pretty elaborate forms from the outside as a student of literature reading them you know you think oh my god this is just crazy it's so elaborate and how could I fit what I want to say into this bizarrely shaped box but for a writer it's really quite different that is it's actually liberating because it tells you what you're gonna do so a lot of what I do is I try to get inside these forms and other strategies in order to see if they have a kind of experiential validity for me. And if I get to that point, then I can kind of be passionate in arguing for my students to try it. I'm going to have to come back and visit again, Dan, because <laughs> I've got a lot of stuff I could ask you. Three more things. Okay. okay. Writing for personal transformation. We've kind of touched on that a little bit. Yeah. I guess I'm beginning from a place where I think that the real treasures of travel are intangibles. We come back with things like those chitenges from Zambia that are on the chair, right? That are fantastic. They're beautiful. They're mementos and they realize the experience. But the things that really are, are more abiding and more permanent are these interior structures, you know, these habits of thought, these ways of seeing that we can internalize. They're kind of hard to talk about, but it has to do with sometimes it's a realization. Sometimes it's an aesthetic appreciation that lifts you up. Like Keats says, what does he say? He, at the end of Ode on a Grecian Urn, he says, beauty is truth, truth, beauty. That's all you know on earth and all you need to know. And travel makes that real. When you see a place that is just so awesome, even though you know there's the full range of human life, of pleasure and suffering, of age and youth and exploitation and generosity, something about the novelty of place, it gives you a sense of what life is. Wordsworth, a poet I wrote my dissertation on in Tintern Abbey, which is a travel poem, says that when you are home and you're meditating or you're thinking about a place you've visited, that 
you can develop this kind of trance-like state where he says, we see into the life of things. Or in another way, another place in the poem, he says, we hear the still sad music of humanity. And there's something about the dislocations of travel that give us a sense of who we are, where we are, and what we're about and what we should be about. So personal transformation, I think that we're questing when we travel for those kinds of experiences that can either give us insight or that can just kind of rearrange us internally so that we're more open, maybe more compassionate, maybe more sensitive people. And writing home. So writing home. My teacher, Annie Dillard, long ago when I was in college, said that one of the great things we should be doing when we write is a sort of writing out of context in the middle of winter in the snowstorm right about summer. You know, on a day like today, sit outside and start sweating and write about the snowstorm, right? I've always kind of thought about that principle. It's a kind of defamiliarizing thing that gets writing going. When you're home, ironically, or maybe counterintuitively, you can kind of engage a lot of your travel more effectively. You can be thoughtful about it. And if you've done what I encourage people to do, which is take a lot of notes in your journal, You can pour through your journal, find place names, find the name of that weird porcelain from Sicily, go back and remember the name of that river in Argentine. Actually, it's Argentine sur Clus, you know, in the middle of France. That will bring you back to these experiences that you had and you now have a new understanding. So I did a summer on a fire lookout tower and what I discovered in the Cascades. And what I discovered is that if one person in one fire lookout tower sees a smoke rising, you know a vector that that fire is on. You know it and you can describe it. If two people in different places see the fire, you know exactly where the fire is because the two vectors meet. And where they meet is where the smoke is, right? So when you're at home, and you have your journal from your travels, it's like that. You have these different vectors of of experience and perspective that just give you a deeper sense of what it is that happened to you and what the significance of the painting might have been or what the significance of being on that mountaintop in Western Ireland was all about for you, why you went there and what you may have seen or learned. Well, I asked you to pull something that you'd written Oh, yeah, you did. And maybe we'll end that way. Are these things that you wrote while traveling or after yeah. travel well, when so the vectors met at home? So I have... We could read a couple. Are you sure? Of course. Yeah, so this is, a, this is... Okay, so what I do is I typically write a lot of journal stuff and then I compose poems from what I've journaled. Sometimes the journals are poems, but... This is actually from last, I think it was April, in Sicily. My wife and I were in Enna, which is actually the town where Persephone was taken to the underworld, uh, according to the ancient world's traditions. It's kind of in the southeast of Sicily on the way to Syracuse, if you're going from Palermo. This is at the Temple of Ceres, so... This is a kind of exploration of the Demeter myth of Persephone being stuck in Hades for six months out of the year because she ate the six pomegranate seeds, right? So this is a poem composed to help me clarify some of my experience about that and what I think about being there. At the Temple of Ceres, at Anna, the old man passes us in the piazza and asks us how he may be of service. The guy in the information office says, Sicilians are paradoxical by nature, by which he seems to mean beautiful but careless, dilapidated but dignified. The couple on top of the rock in the temple of Ceres 
naked and rutting, seem to feel the need to stop when we arrive, sadly, and now everything follows a thread through the ancient loom weights from the necropolis whose two tiny eyes are the diameter of a seed. Now we know as we twist down the road from Enna that we are half lost and will only ever find paths leading only partway through the woods. We'll have gas for only half the drive across the island. We'll be late for the boat and uncertain how we feel as it pushes from the dock without us in the months of cold and dark, in the hours where we always find ourselves, the ones we're living now, where we only understand every other word spoken by the woman holding the knife, or what could be a book, what could be folded wings, what could be the summons she is sending us, the map of our return. I like it a lot. You want I've always been, I do want another. I, I have to stop shying away from poetry because I pretty much write everything, but yeah. I never write poetry, ever. Unless I'm really depressed. And when I'm very depressed, I don't write well. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I, I think, my yeah. And um, a lot of people think of, well, let's put it this way. It's easy to think of poetry as arcane unless you spend some time doing it and, and getting comfortable with it. It really doesn't need to be that scary. I mean, I like to read it. I do like to read it. I don't. Yeah. So I'll write some poems just for you. <laughs> Excellent. That would be awesome. Okay, so um, this is a typical kind of thing. This is not far from what I would write in my journal. I'm sorry, it's a little long, so maybe it should be the last one. But this is really just from sitting at San Marco Square in Florence, just watching. All I'm doing is watching, and I'm looking for how things come together. Do they come together? So it goes like this. A woman gives the umbrella vendor a 20, smiles and walks away as the people around San Marco watch the pigeons. The vendor becomes more insistent with tourists on benches, and a child chases the pigeons. As sunlight glides down the ridge of the building behind the trees, the doors to the church open and school kids roll cigarettes. Shadows of the pigeons climb the piazza. Sparrows learn the child is harmless. The loud American lets us know she's having a good time, that the world only has time for her hilarity. The railing around the statue is made of iron, the same iron that holds up the benches the same anchoring the earlobes of the teenagers smoking the cigarettes they were rolling earlier. Buses circle the piazza like moons careening off orbit. The end of a girl's rolled cigarette sprouts a hair from when she stuck it behind her ear, and it looks like a fuse about to detonate the soft place where her breathing meets the sky where the children walk like little women and men, uneasy with the way they fit into the world. One of the old women observes the ways of the young repeating in patterns and thinks it should have been impossible for things to have changed into this tattered galaxy of shoes and purses, this collection of hardware, smoke and ink, birds and buses, these foreigners and cigarette stubs, this brittle sunlight staining the piazza with such inconsequential darknesses. As she turns away, she sees the piazza as a machine forecasting more raw confusion, such as the sparrow performs, briefly mistaking the woman's hat for a tree. I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for doing this. Sure, my pleasure. All right, until next time, this is The Bittersweet Life. Bye.